the, uh, the next thing we want to talk about, Micah? What do you think? Uh, well, so we have all these legendary items. One semi-deterministic way to farm for them, Helltide. It's mm -hmm. an activity where, well, I guess you can dive into how exactly you can target farm specific item slots to hunt for specific unique items. Um, and it's going to be one of the main end game activities that we'll be partaking in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned before, once the player gains access to Nightmare Torment here, uh, they are going to or, uh, Nightmare Tier. They're going to start gaining. Act, they're going to start seeing some of these new activities. One of them, which is Helltide. Uh, Helltide is basically going to be uh, the switch where you you know as you're running in through the world of Sanctuary. You know the sky turns red, blood begins to fall from the sky, new monsters begin to appear. Everything is more challenging. New like events are going to start showing up, and, and importantly. As you're killing creatures when you're within one of these Helltide areas, you're going to be getting what we call cinders. It's this new currency player to be able to collect while they're specifically within these spaces. And this is great because you get to take these cinders and as you're wandering through the overworld, you might be running on your other players, uh, you might be like helping them do events together, everyone's getting their own cinders as they go. Uh, you'll be looking for these Helltide caches you can see here. And these are great to your point about being able to target farm for certain kinds of items. So every one of the caches in the Helltide zone is actually tied to an item slot. And they all have different costs. So you look kind of like you'll be gathering cinders by playing within this space, trying to locate one of the caches that have the item type that you're looking for. Whether it's like maybe you're looking for an amulet or looking for a ring. You know, maybe you're looking, maybe you're looking for a Shaco. So you're looking actually to go find a helmet cache and you want to keep trying to go after the helmet cache and the rare desperate hope that you're gonna get exactly the unique item that you're looking for, right? That's cool. We want to give you some of that opportunity to give you that opportunity to target farm a little bit. But there's actually a little bit of fun there too. Uh, so one of the, the things that's like one of my personal favorite parts of the Helltide system is the idea that the, uh, the player is, the players, uh, there's like an extra set of stakes, right? When the player's running around with these cinders, uh, they have the chance, if they, if they die, they're going to lose about half of their cinders every time they, they, they fall. And they don't, they don't drop on the ground, they're gone. So you have to be very careful about like when you're looking to overextend as part of the combat experience in order to like farm more cinders, get to the cash that you're looking for. Whatever that is, you are putting yourself at more risk the more you try to like gather and the greeter you get, the more likely it is that you're going to lose things. Did That's you... right. And there's a, a time limit on Helltide too, right? That's right. Helltide yeah. is only active, like the, the, the force of Hell only like arrive for about, like about an hour uh, during, uh, when they are uh, actually active. Then different areas of Sanctuary are picked for, uh, for Helltide Zone each time it rotates and moves around. So you need to make good use of your, uh, your power. And you, if you leave a Helltide Zone, those cinders are gone. You have to, you have to spend them. So if you see that the clock is ticking down, you're getting five or four or three minutes away from the end of the hell tide, you've got to find yourself a cash to kind of deposit those things. Yeah, absolutely. My experience, I first jumped into a hell tide event with, I think, 23 minutes left on the clock. So I start by, okay, I'm scouting out the different uh, chests or, or caches mm. uh, to, set, to see, okay, which is the one that has the, the, the slot that I'm looking for, what are the different costs, and then I'm doing some quick math, okay, I'm gathering cinders at about this rate per minute, I have this many minutes left, okay, I think I could afford the, the most expensive, the weapon slot, and I got to backtrack to that place in order to get there, and then I died, and I'm like, okay, recalculating, yeah. uh, okay, how much time <laughs> do I have left now, and okay, like okay, so, so quickly, quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then I died again, and like, Better luck next time. We'll have another hour before the next one comes around. <laughs> I'll have a better plan this time. Now, granted, you can still get legendary items dropped for you. You can still get really good drops inside Helltide experiences and, while you're killing monsters. So it's not like if you lose those sinners, you've lost all opportunities for rewards. Yeah. But obviously, it does take a little wind out of your sails if you just happen to get jumped at the wrong time. Again, another great opportunity for there to be players nearby when they're trying to help, uh, help out in those yeah. situations. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is really cool about this is that the, so the, these uh, chests or caches boxes with loot and awesome loot inside, mm. right? Um, they, uh, you know, each time a Helltide appears, they appear, they're in different locations, right? right? So yeah. you, you have to go and find them, uh, you know, as Riker was saying. Um, <clears throat> but within, for the duration of that Helltide, they're in fixed places. So, you know, when you go into the Helltide area, it's useful to scout out and see where the caches are for the item spots that you're interested in. Um, and then you can, you know, mentally remember, okay, here, I want to farm around here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to get this, this item or, or whatever. And one thing I want to call out here, um, you know, you, you saw one of the caches on the, the screen earlier, you know, in, in some of our video that we captured for it. Mm -hmm. Now, we did capture that with the, uh, with the UI off, mm -hmm. so you can't see the, the mm -hmm. icon above it, but there is an icon that says, in here there are boots. That's correct. So you yeah. will know before you open that cache uh, what's in it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's not all. I mean, there's, uh, there's other risks and dangers inherent in Helltide areas. Uh, you know, this is an opportunity for you to fight some, like, some different bosses. Again, like I mentioned before, there are different events and things that actually are going to be showing up. 
Uh, and of course, we, we can't really have such a such a, a wonderful experience as Helltide without our baby boy, the Butcher, showing up occasionally and causing serious uh, mayhem and mischief uh, in the uh, the overworld of Sanctuary. So lots of really fun things happen inside these Helltide areas over the course of the player's experience. And it's also an opportunity to farm a special crafting material, right? Uh, that's correct. There are crafting materials like fiend rows and things that really are coming directly from Helltide encounters and those experiences. So you are looking to also get some of the materials you need for like really high tier uh, like weapon and item upgrades from going through these uh, these places. So Helltide is what we're doing to farm uh, crafting materials in order to target farm specific drops. Another big activity that we're going to be doing: Nightmare Dungeons. You want to talk a bit about that? Yeah. So, yeah, Joe, do you have anything you want to talk about for Nightmare yeah, Dungeons so, first? Yeah, so, you know, Nightmare Dungeons are, we, we're going to talk, again, we're going to talk about uh, beta feedback at the end of the, the show here, um, or near, near the end of the show, but uh, uh, Nightmare Dungeons are our key dungeon replayability system for the later part of the game, right? Um, and you're going to get sigils, and Joe's going to talk a little bit about the sigils, but uh, we're really excited for players to get to check out all of the cool ways that the dungeons can really be transformed uh, by the Nightmare Dungeon system. Yeah, so uh, so first up, Nightmare Dungeons, very, very exciting system. Players get, haven't had a chance to play these in our betas yet, but as they get into the, uh, the, uh, the end game content, start mm -hmm. going through World Tiers 3 and 4, you'll begin to see, uh, you'll gain access to some of your first sigils, which are primarily initially earned by completing Whispers of the Dead, one of our other overworld content features that players are able to engage with. Now, uh, sigils are really interesting in that they are tied to a, a level when you find them, which is going to affect the, uh, the level of the monsters inside that space. Uh, they have various afflictions, which we've talked a little bit uh, about in streams in the past. Uh, these are going to modify the way that, that that level rolls out. But Nightmare Sigils, when they are activated, when you, after you collect one, is going to basically open up a portal near an existing side dungeon. And uh, with every, in the pre-release version of Diablo 4 and additional seasons, we basically select a subset of all of the side dungeons of the game that can become Nightmare Dungeons for that period. So players become, uh, become more familiar with a set number of these because they know that they can be populated with these Nightmare Dungeon experiences. So you might already know, whether it's Annex Claim or whatever it is, what the, lay uh, what the layout of a given dungeon might look like normally. But Nightmare, uh, Nightmare Sigil is going to change that by introducing these new afflictions and then also these greater afflictions. Uh, we showed uh, earlier in the video, like this, uh, or right now actually, we're looking at a, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this hell portal, uh, Nightmare Portal that can open up and basically spawn in all these monsters uh, from other like, monster families. It might not be native to that dungeon, which is pretty cool in that we, li we like the idea that players are going to have to kind of deal with these new different threats than what they're typically used to as part, as part of that encounter. And there's a number of these other like greater afflictions, like we showed the uh, uh, Stormbane's Wrath, that, like, that disc thing that was flowing around, behind, uh, around you and occasionally it just pulses out this really big, stunning, damaging effect. So you have to be mindful of where it is to so make sure you avoid it as part of the combat experience. Definitely adds a new wrinkle to gameplay as you're going through. And we add more of these afflictions as the player continues to level up and they get to go deeper and deeper into the, uh, the Nightmare Sigil system, uh, get unlocking higher level sigils, and dealing with like, uh, more and more dangerous threats over the course of time. And this is a, this is a really great place, not only just to, uh, to like, earn experience and really push your build and make sure that you're, uh, you're strong enough to tackle these sorts of challenges, but you'll also be able to, these are really great places to farm for like, sacred and ancestral items in particular, and uh, these are the places that you're gonna be upgrading your Paragon Glyphs. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking more about the Paragon system Right now, so <laughs> in that, like, this is an opportunity to show the actual upgrade glyph screen. I just noticed, like, hey, look, it's actually up right now. What, what timing? Um, so, yeah, when the player reaches the end of a nightmare dungeon, they get to basically go ahead and take one of the glyphs they've been collecting over the course of their uh, their 50 plus experience, and basically uh, slot it into here and choose to upgrade it and make that glyph even more powerful. These socketables will go into your paragon board and end up being some of the single most powerful modifiers you can apply to your character above legendary powers, and even in some cases, even above some unique powers. So it's really in your benefit, based on your build, to be choosing, uh, looking for a set number of these and upgrade them to exactly what you need them to do. And the, uh, so the sigils that we're getting, uh, what I notice is that if you get some afflictions that you don't particularly care about, we have the ability to salvage some in order to craft sigils of our own, right? I think it's a four to one ratio, is that right? Yeah, just about. So if you'll be able to get a lot of these different sigils by going through Nightmare Dungeons, completing Whispers, and other, uh, through other content. And if you're finding sigils that you don't really want or don't really want to run, because maybe it's we're gonna have, like, enemies inside are gonna do additional lightning damage, but you don't have a lot of lightning resist on your build. Maybe you wanna go ahead and like salvage that back at the Occultist. Take that down to its sigil dust and use that to basically make new random sigils for you to go ahead and run with. 
This is ways for players to kind of like, you know, push themselves a little further. They'll unlock higher level sigils they can craft through, uh, through the system over the course of time. And uh, just, uh, it's another way to kind of like reutilize some of the sigils you might not be as interested in running from time to time. You know, one thing I liked about the afflictions was it was making me make choices during the gameplay. Uh, like two that I can speak to, the, the nightmare gates that we were just showcasing. Let's say I'm in the middle of fighting an elite and I'm almost taking him down. I see that nightmare portal opening and I'm like, okay, should I take care of that before it starts spawning more monsters or do I finish this fight first? I'm forced to make a decision mm -hmm. and I got to live with the consequences <laughs> if I think, you know, maybe I should take him down and then no, the fight becomes more challenging and nope, I should have taken care of that gate first. Another one is, I forget the name, but it's, it's some kind of blood cyst that starts to grow, grow, grow. Mm -hmm. And then if you just don't touch it, it eventually explodes in a huge area. Yeah. And it's either, okay, destroy it before it does that or get the heck away as fast <laughs> as possible. Again, um, making choices and it's like, okay, I think I, I, had, I thought I had time to get away. Then I got crowd controlled and then boom, one shot. So uh, I like how it changes the dungeon experience depending on which of these afflictions that you, you get. Yeah, absolutely. And there's death counts in some of these as well. As time goes on, you get into the deeper ones. Or you gotta be careful, you can't choose to just throw yourselves at these things, and if you're making mistakes, you have to really evaluate carefully how you're progressing. Yeah. Sure, yeah. That's true. So, so yeah, you got a chance to play through some of those. Uh, so yeah, Nightmare Dungeon is very exciting. And they'll go up beyond level 100 as well. Actually, oh, wow. so uh, this, is, this is a content type that you can actually fight up to, creatures up to level 150, actually, as part of the experience, based on how, how far you're able to push yourself as time goes on. So really excited about how, like, how far players can go with that. All right, now you're talking about glyphs and the Paragon system, so let's talk more about those Paragon boards. Oh, let's do it. Okay. Paragon boards. So we've, uh, we've talked a bit about Paragon in the past. You know, we've shown pictures of the board just like this, and we've shown you things like, hey, look, like, here's normal node, and this is a way that you're going to earn, like, five willpower. You know, uh, but that's not all this board is about. You know, there's a, lot of other, uh, there's a lot of other complexity and things to deal with in here. So there are basically four types of nodes to kind of, like, quickly uh, reprise some of this information. Uh, the first, of course, is normal nodes. Then we have what you show here is matic nodes. These are different affixes that you can collect over the course of time. Usually they're like a little bit more difficult to find a direct like version of on items. So like something like this, for example, crackling energy uh, damage. So there's a so that's a that's a a sorceress of like a lightning uh, lightning spec sorceress uh, ability or uh, passive effectively, where uh, she'll occasionally be crackling out damage to uh, to nearby uh, targets. You can now boost that by finding this particular magic node, which kind of might uh, eventually unlock other builds for you to kind of go and chase after. But then there are rare nodes, which is on the next slide. And uh, here, okay, so there's a, some information here. Uh, rare nodes have a pretty powerful effect right off the bat. You know, and, but then on top of that, there's this, this bonus effect down below that you can, you can sort of see. Where uh, on this one, it is, yeah, another 16% damage to elites. If you reach a certain amount of dexterity for your character. Mm -hmm. So the point here is that like, rare nodes on their own, of which there's about 10 or more per, uh, per board. Rare nodes are already pretty powerful generically. But then on top of that, if you were able to hit these thresholds for the, uh, for the stat requirements for these, uh, these rare nodes, that is going to make them very, very potent for, uh, for you indeed. And when you're looking at the board, these are some of the most, the most critical things you'd be thinking about when you're plotting your path through each board, which, you, of course, there are you know, a number of boards available for you at launch. And then when you'll be able to rotate them, you'll have to choose how you want to progress through rare nodes, whether you want to engage with the legendary nodes or not. This is a really important thing. Yeah. One, other, one other bit about this, just because I, it's easy for me to forget about, is that when you're going from Paragon board to Paragon board, like in the first board, this might be the cost. But then when you're looking at the second board that, uh, that you're progressing through, those requirements are actually going to go up. So it's not in your interest to go like run from board to board, just unlock as many of these as you can directly through that way. You need to spend a little bit of time into the board and pick the ones that you really want because the next board that you unlock to get more rare nodes of, of different types, those will be a little more expensive to unlock those bonus effects. The thing I think is really interesting about these is when I... The, the way that I look at the board, right, when I open a Paragon board, the first thing I do is go and look at the, rare, the nearest rare nodes to me, mm. to, to my, where I'm starting, right? <clears throat> and then I, see, I look at the, the uh, requirements for those bonuses, and then I start looking at the normal nodes on the way. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'm pretty close to the dexterity required here through my gear. Um, are there some dexterity nodes that I could hit on the way here that would take me over it? And you know how much do I care about that particular bonus? And then I'm you know comparing it to the other ones, and I'm thinking about that. So the the normal nodes actually become sort of a path that you're trying to take to turn on these bonuses. Absolutely, and that's not all. Uh, there's one more node type as well, and then we're going to get back to normal nodes in just a second. So then we have our legendary nodes. So every one of the boards for each of the classes has a legendary node somewhere on it, and these are really really powerful 
uh, powers like you'd expect. They are a legendary power, effectively unique to the Paragon board system for that class and for the whatever the, that particular board is trying to convey as its overall build type. So these are really, really powerful things to go and collect, but they're actually not the most powerful thing. This is just an additional extra powerful ethics you can kind of apply to your character, but you kind of do this in concert with other things that you're looking for, like I mentioned the rare notes. And I also talked before about glyphs, and we're going to talk about that next. So when you, basically, as you're going through the board, there are going to be these sockets that you can unlock, and the sockets are going to be sitting adjacent to a number of other regular nodes. Now, the way that glyphs work is that you're going to put them into one of these sockets, and they are going to be affecting nearby nodes and also fueled by other nearby nodes. So if you hit certain thresholds inside uh, some of the glyphs, you're also going to unlock powerful bonuses. They're going to other always uh, also affect uh, nearby nodes at the same time. And as I mentioned before, glyphs can be leveled up pretty high. They continue to grow the radius of the affected nodes as you level up through certain tiers. So means they can uh, affect larger and larger areas. And the boards are not symmetrical in nature as you're progressing through. Because the player can rotate their board and choose which gate they actually want to, uh, to uh, enter from, uh, you're, you have to like kind of choose from board to board which, where are the sockets on this board? Are they near the stats I really want for this glyph? Because, you know, this glyph is going to be fueled by, you know, dexterity nodes within range of the glyph, uh, glyph effect. And it's going to do additional like, critical strike damage, or whatever it's going to do for me as a result. Uh, that's a really, really important choice to make. And because all of the boards have different configurations, different socket locations, and different things near those sockets, you have a lot of interesting decisions to make about, like, where you actually want to invest your time. How does it matter? Like, how does it feel to do this relative to the rare nodes you might need on that board from, uh, from a different board instead? Like, fun decisions for players to make as they're going through. We want, we want ultimately to feel like the Paragon board system allows for, like, two, you know, incinerate, focus, burn type sorceresses to feel like they've got very different paths to the Paragon board, different decisions to make, even if all of their skill choices are identical. Yeah, it's something that, you know, we've talked about a lot with Diablo 4. It's the idea that even if you have, uh, you know, let's say incinerate is a powerful sorcerer build uh, for, you know, um, and, and you want to play Incinerate, mm. you're not going to necessarily be the same, uh, have exactly the same uh, loadout as another Incinerate sorcerer. That's right. One thing I found really cool about the Paragon system that I, I didn't realize at first is that the, every Paragon board is almost like a Paragon class, like a specialization class, where it's all built around a certain theme, fantasy, play style, um, and it all revolves around that, that central or off-central legendary node, and then the, the, the rares kind of support that same theme, and it extends to the blues. So like on a necromancer, like, oh, this board is like the pure summoner uh, fantasy, and this one is the, 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 the blood mage. And looking at it that way really like, made it uh, very cool for me to be able to explore, okay, you know, I can merge these two together. I'm going to go like bone and, and blood and just further... Uh, yeah, explore and, and dive into that, that specialization. Yeah. You know, there's uh, 220 Paragon points that players will be able to have by the time they finish leveling up their character at level 100. Uh, we want those choices to feel like they've got meaning individually. Players can, uh, can respect them for those choices if they want for gold cost. Uh, we want to be able to play with this system and be able to like, kind of experiment with different ideas as they go. But importantly, we want them to feel like that the choices they made for the 220 matter a great deal to their overall performance. Yeah. Yeah, super fun. I think, you know, but, you know. 